the survivors, just here to the death. Uh, that, that, that's great. Great to see you. Uh, and I think we've got we've got an exciting session uh, for you. We're going to cover certainly an awful lot of lot of ground uh, in in the next few few hours. Um, can I start kind of old school and uh, and ask for a show of hands? Just a show of hands. Uh, how many of you uh, consider yourself to be archaeologists of the historical period? Those of you who haven't put up your hands, I'm presuming you're prehistorians. Uh, welcome, prehistorians. We're really going to look forward to your uh, <laughs> your, your contribution. Uh, your one up, one out. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> those of you, those of you who claim to be uh, archaeologists of the historical period, um, how many of you are aware of elemental theory? Good. And how many of you are currently using uh, elemental theory in your interpretation of the archaeological record? All right, those number, number of those, of those, of those hands are, are going down. Well, uh, our session today, of course, uh, is designed to, to encourage you uh, to use uh, elemental theory. We, we think it rather bizarre that uh, archaeologists have turned to a whole set of uh, 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 theoretical paradigms, um, uh, often born of the Enlightenment, uh, born from a whole series of, of uh, philosophical positions, but we seem to have overlooked uh, the very the uh, theoretical positions that were contemporary to the worlds that uh, we study. There's another reason why we uh, have been encouraged to, to hold this, this session, and that is that if, as we hope to show you, elemental and humoral theory were uh, s such important ways of thinking about the world uh, around people in the past, then we should expect to find uh, its signature in the archaeological record. So with, with those two ideas uh, in mind, uh, we, we need to make a, a prompt start because we've got uh, so much to get through. So I've given myself uh, the task of, of introducing uh, elemental and briefly humoral theory uh, to you, uh, uh, with the hope that that provides a background for, for what is to, to follow. Now, I'm sure that all of you here will have encountered the elements in some shape or form. Uh, they are represented in uh, all sorts of symbolic ways uh, now. Uh, perhaps many of you first encountered them when you went off to the tattoo parlour and were thinking about what tattoos you, you wanted to get. I, I, would, I would suggest this, this ambigram here is great, you know, uh, the upside, upside down, earth, water, air and, and fire. Representations of the, the elements, of course, come in all sorts of shapes and, and forms. These happen to be uh, my favourite, a series, well, it's a, a series that's sort of put together. There are several versions of this series of four elements by the artist Archimboldo, 16th century artist. Here uh, you're seeing earth, represented by uh, mammals, uh, water, represented by fish, the birds representing air uh, and fire fantastic uh, representations. Well, however you've, you've encountered them, um, uh, they've been around for some time. And I need to give you just a, a little bit of a brief history, I think. Um, thinkers implicitly and explicitly have been talking about uh, the elements uh, back to the, the middle of the first millennium uh, BC. Pre-Socratic uh, thinkers uh, implicated the, the elements, whether all together uh, or individually or in pairs, as the original cause of the world, uh, the cosmos, uh, that they found uh, around them. Um, it's implicit, for example, in the works of, of Pythagoras, uh, who gives you another option for a tattoo, by the way, here. Uh, that's his, his uh, tractate list. But um, the, the most coherent uh, understanding uh, and explanation of the, the elements comes uh, with Plato and then with his, his student Aristotle. And it's on this Western idea, the, the idea of the elements as it developed uh, across Western Europe, that I want to concentrate on, on too. But uh, also recognise that there are uh, parallel traditions that are, are developing uh, elsewhere. So what did Plato tell us about the, the four elements? Well, Plato's world was uh, a tangible, a, a solid world. 
we can think of it as a, the, a realm of forms. Forms need to be seen and need to be touched. And it's fire that enables uh, us to see things and it is the earthy element in things that allows us to, uh, to touch them. So there are the, the first two of our four, four elements. But for Plato, these had to be connected and joined, not with one, but two, because he's dealing uh, with a three-dimensional world, two other elements, uh, with air and with uh, water. Now, these elements ha have mass, uh, uh, and earth being the heaviest of the, the four elements, tends uh, to the centre or to the bottom uh, of, of the elemental hierarchy, water lighter than, than air, uh, uh, water lighter than, than earth, but, but heavier than air, uh, and so on, up to, to, to fire the lightest of the elements. This then is a conception of the cosmos that, that Plato provides us in a sort of perfect form, but a form that never exists, where the elements would go if they were allowed to go uh, uh, by the natural course of things. Generally, elements uh, are out of place and therefore moving up and down through this hierarchy uh, all the time. Now, together with uh, their, their mass, uh, Plato also conceptualised these, these elements in terms of their form. Um, Earth uh, as a cube, it starts to explain why Earth doesn't tend to move very far. You imagine the, the force that needs to be exerted to, to push uh, a cube, for example, whereas water, more fluid, uh, represented here as the isosahedron, uh, more liable to, to movement, air becoming more pointy, and fire the most pointy of all, the tetrahedron. Its pointiness, of course, allowing fire to penetrate and, and, uh, into, into, other, into other substances. So Plato is, is giving us quite a lot to, to, to work, uh, work with. Um, and he gives us a warning, which we ought to bear in mind uh, briefly, uh, but I don't, I don't want to concentrate on it. And that is that the earth and the water and the air and the fire that we encounter in the terrestrial world are not the same as the elements he's talking about. Um, fire itself is made up of the four elements. Water is made up of the four elements. It's just that there's more water in water and more fire in fire and so on. Now, under Aristotle, we have developments, important developments. The first is that Aristotle gives us a fifth element, the quintessence, ether, uh, which he sees as, as the substance of the, the cosmos. The four elements, therefore, under Aristotle, become uh, related simply to the terrestrial or the sublunar uh, uh, sphere, earth, water, air, and fire. Should we then be talking about five elements? Uh, or four elements. Well, that's interesting, particularly when you think about different kinds of development, uh, elemental developments in other parts of, of the world. They're not analogous, of course, but here the Wang Xing, uh, the Wu Xing, here the five elements of Chinese philosophy uh, might map more easily onto Aristotelian five elements. But what Aristotle does particularly is to tell us that we need to concentrate uh, not on the elements themselves, but their qualities, earth, water, air, and fire, um, are related to particular qualities. Hot, cold, dry, wet. So air is wet and hot, fire is hot and dry, and so on, and so forth. And it's these qualities uh, which get the elements uh, working. Apply heat and coolness to the elements, uh, and things, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the elemental qualities of things will change. Um, let's say with dryness and, and wetness, one can think about it hot and cold as, as sort of active uh, drivers to elemental change, and dryness and, and wetness to, to passive ones. You can see here how interconnected all the elements are. They are all sharing at least one quality with a, another, another element. Now it's from this basic elemental wheel that everything else then subsequently develops. We'll be talking today about humoral theory and Hurimal theory maps very easily onto uh, this, this wheel. Humoral theory posits uh, that the body is made up of four principal uh, fluids, that's sanguine, blood, uh, yellow bile, black bile, uh, and flam, phlegm. And they, uh, and they, as you can see here, relate to the elements and to, to, to their qualities. 
It's this that allows people in the past to see the body itself uh, made up of the elements uh, and, and its humours as being representative of the whole, the microcosm of the, uh, of the macrocosm. The elements too map on to, to time, so that there are qualities, that the planets themselves have elemental qualities, which gets us to, uh, to, to the seasons and to, to the zodiac and to the movement of the months, which map very easily onto the, the elemental wheel. Uh, and so connect us back to labour of the months, uh, for example, um, or here at Amiens Cathedral, uh, these, these wonderful images, uh, personifications of, of both the labours, uh, the zodiac, and, uh, 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 and so on. Elemental, ele the elements uh, map onto uh, time at a, a human scale. Um, so here is Bertford's uh, wonderful uh, diagram here, which uh, uh, builds in the four elements of man, uh, the four ages of man, uh, into this ele uh, elemental scheme. So childhood or infancy is associated um, uh, with, with air, for example, uh, youth with fire, and so on. And elemental qualities of people change over their, their life course. Uh, I'm only going to go uh, this far uh, now, because I, I only have a couple of minutes, minutes left. Um, but the elements map uh, into people's uh, conception of space too. So the cardinal points here you can see that map uh, onto this wheel. And so we've got really interesting associations. We've got air associated with sanguinity, associated with the season of spring, associated uh, with, with Taurus uh, and, and the, month, the months of, of, of spring, and to uh, the, the east as a direction. From then these very basic concepts, four words in fact, earth, water, air and fire, hot, cold, wet, moist, it's built up this extraordinary uh, uh, connected understanding of the, uh, of, of the world around people and the people's integration into that. And I don't know what you see when you look at that, but what I see uh, is an extraordinarily useful model um, that might help us understand entanglement, or dwelling, or materiality, or phenomenology agency, structure, personhood, it's all there, it's all connected. We don't need anything more than that wheel, and that's what we will hope to show you. Thank you.